do... How did they do that? A cheap and slightly stupid programme that looks at the seemingly impossible and asks the question, how did they do that? <laughs> I'm Devin Lynham. And I'm the bird who stands beside him. <laughs> Now, during the 1980s, virtually all Britain's major public assets were sold, plus we were a huge oil producer. And yet, despite these colossal revenues, the government still managed to destroy our manufacturing base and create an enormous trade deficit. So, how did they do that? <laughs> well, bugger if I know. We took a closer look. <laughs> What happened was that the government decided to use the profits gained from asset-stripping Britain to finance tax cuts for the rich. The idea being that they would use these windfalls to invest in industry. All went according to plan. As the rich did invest in industry, they invested in German industry, French industry, Japanese industry and Taiwanese industry. <laughs> Next week, we'll be back with a new series entitled How the Hell Did They Get Away With It? <laughs> Good night. Good night. Occasionally said that clever political satire is dead. That's what they say. They say these days it's all just smug sneers and knob gags. Well, I say blame the politicians. They've become self satirizing. There are no gags left to write. I mean, three weeks ago, the Prime Minister offered as proof of Britain's economic recovery that the Germans were buying up our motor industry. Well, how's a comic supposed to top a gag like that? Eh? <laughs> Now we discover that this sale of Rover apparently to the Germans, actually, it's rather worrying. And why are we so worried? Because it's pissed off the Japanese. <laughs> well, rule Britannia, Britain's economic recovery, has to be the most eagerly awaited comeback since good old Torvald and Dean. Next signals on the economy today, with Britain's last coal mines and shipyards facing closure. But in a surprising piece of good news for the Chancellor, WH Smiths have just announced the sale of a biro in Western Supermarket. <laughs> Further evidence in the High Street today that the long-awaited economic upturn is at last becoming a reality. Yes, well, we're particularly pleased with these figures because the biro sold was not in fact just any old biro, but a luxury refillable item in a presentation plastic box. So what we're seeing here is the consumer rediscovering his taste for luxury. <laughs> Figures out the day show that someone's been down the shops, and that's what the Chancellor's cheering about. Not that we've made anything or built anything, but that some poor sad axe down at Dixon's buying a Japanese video on credit. <laughs> Whoopee, Britain's got an economy again. We have to interrupt this broadcast to bring you urgent news on the economy. The consumer-led recovery continued unabated as shoppers literally started to spend the country out of recession with the confirmed sale of an eight-piece set of garden furniture from the DIY Superstore in Cheam. Well, of course, we're delighted to have this first rate pick, although we must remain cautious and remind ourselves that it is, in fact, only one set of garden furniture that has been sold. Nonetheless, it was quite an expensive set of garden furniture and, quite frankly, it's very nice to have good news at last and be able to show the glue mongers and glue mongers and the moaning minis how very, very long they are. <laughs> Some people feel that the comedy is a divisive art form, that it's all about cynicism and sneering. Tonight, by way of contrast, I should like to talk about that which unites us. Fear, for instance, unites us all. We all live in constant fear. Fear of everything. Fear of social rejection. Fear of the unknown, but above all, fear of the ridiculous. The things that I am scared of beggar belief. When I get my money out of the wall with my cash point card, when I'm putting the number in, I'm disguising the whole operation <laughs> with my whole body.
body because I'm convinced that the bloke stood 200 yards up the road with his back to me with a white stick in his hand is memorising my number. Our fears defy logic. If you've got a credit card and that card expires, you know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to cut it in half. That's what the manufacturers recommend. Expired credit card, cut it in half. So, you cut it in half, but then a fear takes over and you think to yourself, oh dear, better cut it in quarters. <laughs> Just to be sure, because let's face it, any shopkeeper faced with two severed halves of an expired credit card rudely sellotaped together is scarcely going to notice the subterfuge, eh? <laughs> so, you cut it in quarters, but by this time all semblance of reason has departed from your mind as you think, oh, I better just cut it into eight, so... <laughs> and now paranoia has taken over altogether as you cut that thing into 16 little pieces and still you can't relax, still you can't be sure, until eventually you say to yourself, I know, I know what I'll do, I'll stick up the bits in my bin at home and take the other half to work with me. <laughs> we are all prey to the wildest fantasies in our terror. In the daytime, a distant creek is a distant creek. At night, it sounds exactly like the stealthy footfall of a mad axeman. <laughs> and were it actually to be the stealthy footfall of a mad axeman, what is our defence? Do we run? Do we hide? Do we call the police? No. We pull our duvets up. <laughs> well, that's all right, isn't it? <laughs> Safe now, eh? <laughs> You've seen it on the label. 10% duck down, 90% acrylic, keeps you warm in winter, cool in summer, and guaranteed impenetrable to an axe. <laughs> <laughs> I am scared of everything. One morning, I was staying in a hotel, right, and I had cornflakes. Right? It was in one of those, the cornflakes were in one of those, those little individual variety boxes. You know, the ones are a bit of fun, aren't they? <laughs> Until you realise there's bugger all in them. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm eating these cornflakes, right? As you do. Not remotely surprised at how good they taste. <laughs> <laughs> those ads are extraordinary. <laughs> Have you forgotten how good they taste? <laughs> no. <laughs> Incredible, trying to convince an entire nation that they've forgotten about cornflakes. <laughs> that somehow it's going to be like a big vibe to shove a spoon for. I mean, it's, just, it's just not a surprising product, I'm sorry. Sellotape, have you forgotten how sticky it is? <laughs> Eggs, remember that great yellow bit in the middle? I mean, anyway, having recovered from the shock of the taste of cornflakes, you know, I mean, they brought me round as they were. And, uh, and, uh, it, it, it's giving me, I'm reading the box, you see, and it's giving me great news. Oh, yes. It is informing me that by eating these cornflakes, I am, in fact, consuming a one a quarter of my adult daily requirement of niacin, a thiamine, and riboflavin. <laughs> wow! What be? Great news. Except not really, because, you see, all day, all day afterwards, I, I was sort of nervous and, and anxious. Like, it was a kind of kind of niggling fear in the back of my head because, you see, I, I was thinking to myself, where am I getting the other three quarters from? <laughs> I mean, was I supposed to eat four bowls? I mean, that's a, that's a lot of cornflakes. <laughs> then I think, well, that's just today. I mean, I haven't had cornflakes for weeks. Is this, is this problem accumulative? I mean, how far am I behind? <laughs> of course, in a saner moment, I remember that I don't know anything about niacin, thiamine, and riboflavin. I mean, it might be crap, might it? I mean, or maybe you get it in everything. Beer, crisps, one pack of fags probably contains a lifetime supply of niacin, thiamine, and riboflavin. <laughs> you see, you see, our fears are there to be played upon. I'm fearful of that, because fear leads to intolerance. Of course it does. And intolerance leads to trouble. I mean, I was reading the other day that there's a lot of people want, want gun ownership laws loosened. They say criminals are getting guns and we should be able to defend ourselves. This is madness. I mean, the last time that gun control was debated seriously was after Hungerford, when a man went mad with a machine gun. And at the time, I seem to remember a police a spokesperson saying, we don't want to ban these weapons altogether because what about the rights of the genuine sportsman? <laughs> Excuse me? A genuine sportsman with a machine gun. <laughs> Bit of a contradiction in terms, I think. It doesn't give the elk a lot of options. Does it? <laughs> but nonetheless, the attitude from the Home Office was in agreement. They said, we don't want to ban these weapons altogether. What we need is a better vetting process. That's what we need, they said. What questions should we ask of a person, they said, to find out whether he or she is a suitable person to own a machine gun? 
Well, it's very simple, actually. There's only one question. The question is, uh, do you wish to own a machine gun? <laughs> and if the answer is yes, then you're clearly not a suitable person to have one. <laughs> I mean, it's that any one of us could be a victim or a perpetrator of intolerance. Any one of us. I mean, I bet everyone watching out, everyone here tonight, and everyone out, out in television land considers themselves a fair and reasonable, decent person. I know I do. I hope I am. I'm a lefty, but I'm, I'm a kind of general lefty, you know? I, I want everyone to have a job, but if there's only one parking space left at the supermarket, I'd kind of like to have it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we are all of us capable of flipping at any time. If you want an argument for gun control, Consider yourself, right? Consider yourself sat in your car, in a queue, at the traffic lights. And you are second in the queue, and the person in the car in front has failed to notice for a quarter of a second that the lights have turned green. <laughs> now, be honest, if you were armed, he'd be dead. <laughs> Right, Mr. Rowan, welcome to your advanced test for motorway driving. Hi. First of all, show me your nose manoeuvre, if you would, please. <laughs> Thank you. And your oh, come on, if you would. Oh, come on! Thank you. On the command now, would you mirror, signal and manoeuvre? <laughs> Thank you. Radio and cassette, please. Underpants. <laughs> and finally, when I tap the dashboard, I wish you to react as if the car in front has edged forward seven feet. Good. Well, I'm happy to inform you that you have passed. Great. One or two points. Um, I'd like to have seen a little bit more examination of the contents of the fingernail after the nose <laughs> I quite certainly realise there should never have been a cassette in the cassette box. I don't believe I did that. <laughs> I knew that you're fully qualified to sit in any contraflow in Great Britain. Right. I'll walk from here. <laughs> What's wrong with us? Let me tell you. I mean, if God made man in his own image, he must be a pretty strange sort of bloke. Now, there, will, there will, of course, be some women out there who object to me calling God a bloke. They will say it is sexist to turn God into a patriarchal figure. They will say that God was not necessarily a man. And I say, rubbish. <laughs> of course God's a man. We need look no further than periods for evidence of that. Oh, when God was sorting out the plumbing of the two sexes, which sex did he decide would have the periods? Well, bugger me backwards with a blood market vegetable. <laughs> but let's let the girls do it. <laughs> Although, ladies, ladies, <laughs> ladies, <laughs> you can't moan about your periods no more. No, 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 you can't, no, no, not since. Not since a champon technology improved in such leaps. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll bet having your periods a bit of a laugh these days. <laughs> I'll bet it's more like a little holiday, isn't it? <laughs> my period next week, super. Must dust off me bike shorts and me rollerblades. <laughs> As for those new pads, the pads, they're inc you lucky girls. I'm filled with envy. They're unbelievable. They've got wings on them. <laughs> wings on them, they'll be putting engines on next one. <laughs> <laughs> of course, God's a man. We need look no further than the smear test for evidence of that. <laughs> the dawn of time when God was working out the plumbing of the two sexes, which sex did he ordain would have to hear every three years throughout their adult lives that terrifying phrase, knees apart, keep your bottom down, <laughs> which means an ice-cold duck-billed torpedo <laughs> is about to be shoved up your kyber. <laughs> oh, yes, the blokes don't know that phrase, but the women do. If any blokes were to sneak up behind a woman tonight and whisper in her ear, knees apart, keep your bottom down, she'd go, <laughs> The most terrifying phrase in the English language in medicine. The doctor says, knees apart, keep your bottom down. I'm about to drive something not dissimilar to a Ford Cortina up your <laughs> Of course, God's a man. 
we notice it's not the men who find themselves a prostrate in the least dignified position known to science. You girls, you can see the doctor between your knees. The bastard's trying to make conversation. <laughs> he says, so, what part of town do you come from? Then? You say, it doesn't matter, just scrap my belly and piss off. <laughs> say, they point out, come on, Ben, not all these doctors are blokes, some of them are women. No, that's true, but they all turn into Dr Frankenstein when they get in a smear surgery. You can see them between your knees as they lope across the surgery. <laughs> Loping towards the cold cabinet, he opens the doors of the cabinet, drags out the ice-cold duck-billed <laughs> torpedo. He says, I'll just warm it up for you, love. He, he, he. <laughs> Chipping the ice off it, snapping it together like that weapon Edward Fox uses in the day of the jackal. Schlong, ding, flong, dang, and it's ready. And up it goes, girls. Up it goes. And just when you think there's nowhere further for it to go, when it seems that every nook and cranny of your intimate plumbing has been stuffed to bursting point with ice cold metal, click, out come the extending arms and start forcing out the side. Yes. I swear they use the same technology they use on the Channel Tunnel. <laughs> Expecting a little Frenchman to emerge, saying, Bonjour, hello, I'm from hello, my friend. He's got you on the slab, girls. He's got you there. Your knees are up in the air. He looks you in the eye. He says, Do try and relax. <laughs> <laughs> you say to him, You sit down hard on a traffic bollard, mate, and you try and relax. <laughs> Finally, he says, Right, I'm going to pull it out now. I'm going to pull it out. You're thinking, Oh, good, I hope I don't make a big rude noise when it comes up. <laughs> How does he know these things? I ask, I tell you. Researching my act is a really weird one, actually. <laughs> Finally, shlunk, out it comes. He wipes it on his jeans in a cavalier fashion, <laughs> hurls it into a petri dish. He looks his victim in the eye. He says, now then, would you like me to check your breasts, miss? <laughs> oh, certainly, Doctor. After the caring way you've handled my bunny, I can't wait for you to have a go on my knockers. Where do you want to start, eh? Sugar tongs on the nipples? You'll enjoy that. <laughs> Now, <laughs> I must stress, very important is, I do this routine obviously not for the women. I do it for the men. I mean, the women know. I mean, they know what I'm saying. In fact, apologies, really. I mean, there may well be some women watching thinking, come on, leave it out, but I'm going to have one next week. <laughs> <laughs> Although, actually, I say the women know, but I feel I've got to say this. I must say this, that despite the fact that it's after 10 at night, there may well be uh, some young women, oh, still watching, uh, who have not, as of yet, had a smear test <laughs> and now have no intention of ever having <laughs> Well, look, you've got to. It's terribly important. I've got this terrifying vision of all these young girls turning off the telly and saying, I am never having a smear test, Mum! Ben Elton says they park a Ford Cortina at you! <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got to have one. It's terribly important. But if it, if it makes you feel any better, I think if there's a man in your life, even if it's just a brother, make sure he knows what's going on. Because I don't think men would have such a dismissive attitude towards gynaecological matters if they had any idea of what it involved. I mean, most men don't know. I, I didn't know. I'm 34 years old now. I basically know the mechanics of a smear test. But I don't know, 10 years ago, when I was 24, I didn't know. I didn't know what one was. I mean, I knew what it was for, but I didn't know what happened. I mean, I thought I knew. But, but I'll tell you what I thought happened in the smear test. <laughs> it's a bit embarrassing, but it might help somebody out there. I thought a smear test consisted of... <laughs> well, you would, wouldn't you? No feeling. No sooner do you get the floor done when. Sorry, Ma. <laughs> Sorry, dear. That's why a friend recommended new. Glam floor cleaner. Just a little <laughs> casserole instead of a stock cube, and you'll never have to clean another floor again. <laughs> For a really lusting shine, don't clean the floor, poison your family. Britain's fragile economic growth suffered a setback today, as a biro which had been presumed sold in Western Supermare was returned to the shop. <laughs> Tonight on Urban Wildlife, we look at perhaps the most shy and elusive of all city-dwelling creatures, the dirty mag buyer. <laughs> tremendously shy creatures and go to great lengths to avoid being spotted. <laughs> we set up our hive 
been a busy urban news agent behind the computers. <laughs> now, just watch the little fellow in the hat. He's spending an awfully long time over that computer magazine. Now, that's a telltale sign. Look, he's glancing about. There's an anxious look, a quickening of the heart. What a beautiful creature he is. There's nervous fear. He's terribly shy. Now, watch him. He's preparing to spring. He's going to pick up a newspaper for cover. See that? Now, look. There it is. The speed and grace of these timid little fellows is quite wonderful. Now, let's watch it again in slow motion. Now, see this? We didn't spot that before. The news agent studying the magazine, a very embarrassing moment. It's a terrible moment for the shy creature as he has to wait for his change. It seems to go on forever. Can you see the pulse quickening, the heart thumping? But he's out. He's away. Oh, no, he's not. He had to wait for his receipt. Missed that face. Speaking to foreigners has never been easier with LinguaLearn audio and video cassettes. Where is the bus station? <laughs> LinguaLearn also makes you fluent in the essential hand and body movements. Bus station! <laughs> Toy learn! So whether you're going to France... Sausage, egg and chips! Spain... Sausage, egg and chips! Italy or Greece... Sausage, egg and chips! Learn perfect foreign the LinguaLearn way. And it'll cost you much less than you think. What's that in proper money, then? <laughs> Right now, we're asking the question, should the birth mother of a semi-adopted, disturbed foster child have the right to sue a near neighbor whose dysfunctional dog poops on their lawn? <laughs> Intolerance can overtake us at any time. I was in this post office the other day. It wasn't, you know, a nice, friendly old post office. You know, the, the little ones you used to get sweets in when you were a kid. You remember that? You know, abandoned teeth, all ye who enter here. <laughs> It was just occurred to me the other day, we, we used to get these sweets that were shaped like dentures. <laughs> you remember that? You used to take them around, oh, look at my teeth! <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit, like, a bit sick, isn't it? Don't you think? <laughs> sweets are shaped like teeth. It's a bit like having I mean, lung-shaped cigarettes, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, it wasn't, it wasn't one of those great old post offices. It was a modern city one. You know how since the Citizens' Charter, everything's got a charter? The post office has got a charter and it says that they are dedicated to reducing the number of queues. And they've done it, too, because now there's only one queue. A very flipping long one <laughs> that winds all the way round the post office. We all shuffle up the post office. <laughs> then we all shuffle down. Office. I know it's fairer that way, but I sort of miss the good old days. You remember when you used to have the old six Q steeplechase? It put a little excitement into your life, didn't it? You'd be at the door first, you'd have to choose your cue. I'm stood at the door, surveying the scene. The first cue, there's, a, there's an old girl, she's got a pension book and an expression that says, I am looking forward to a very long conversation about this, how, how small the 10p bits are and how you can't tell a fiver from a 20 pound note these days. I'll avoid her. There's a bloke with a Portuguese phrase book and a speech impediment. Beyond him, there's the mother who appears to have been having it off with Beelzebub, or at least she's certainly got the child of Satan sat in the push chair. <laughs> Or perhaps he's only minding the kid for the Prince of Darkness while the Prince visits a plague of boils on the neck of the hormonally imbalanced youth trying to pay for his moped licence in 15 <laughs> quarterly instalments. It's a nightmare. The queue, I, I mean, the one next to me, it, it, that's not too bad. The one near the door, not too bad, except I can't see the one at the far end of the post office. That might be better. It's the terrible queue dilemma. Do I join this one and risk the fact that, that I might be missing a better one at the other end, or do I quickly pop across and check out the far end, which means possibly losing the one near the door? I'm trans fixed. Should I stay or should I go? A reckless impulse. I'm off. Past the old granny, past Mrs Lucifer, round the kid with the pizza on his neck. I get a look at the last queue. Oh no, there's a bloke with what appears to be a rather poorly wrapped set of garden furniture at the front, wondering where to stick the stamps. So, I quickly double back past Pizza Net, granny and the devil's child, but bugger it now. The queue near the door's ruined. It's got three Swedish foreign exchange students with out-of-date visitors' passports. I turn again, distraught that I've blown both ends. Oh, uh, obviously. <laughs> the bloke with the garden 
furniture has turned out to be a lightning stamp licker. I bet his wife's a happy woman. And he's gone. <laughs> that's the cue. That's my cue. I've got to go. So I start to sprint, sprint across the post office. But the old granny spotted it too. She's decided to swap cues, the old bag. We're neck and neck as we pass the child of Satan. But I'm inching ahead at, uh, at Peter Nick. Thank God for NHS waiting list. If she'd had a new hip, she could have given me a race. But I'm free. <laughs> I'm free. No, the bitch hurls a string bag full of Brussels sprouts to mark her place in the queue. Damn! I turn and face my conqueror. You have bested me this time, old hag. <laughs> but there will come another pension day, and then your Zimmer frame will be as chaff beneath my chariot wheels. <laughs> A bit of excitement, you see. But these days, we all shuffle up the post office. <laughs> and we all shuffle down the post office. You know how... No, brief digression, but you know how they're talking about how to make Shakespeare more relevant in schools? It's relevant. It's, this is important to the routine. Well... I don't think they're teaching it properly. I remember once reading this essay. It was called Shakespeare, Our Contemporary. I've always remembered it because it posited a, a rather wonderful theory. It suggested that such was Shakespeare's genius, that even though he wrote 400 years ago, nonetheless, his window on the human experience is as relevant today as it ever was, even though he could never recognise anything about our world. Nonetheless, his timeless verse reflects our triumphs and our pain as unerringly as it did the people of his own time. Shakespeare, our contemporary. The Germans recognise the phenomena too. They call it unsere Shakespeare, our Shakespeare. I think it's a, a beautiful theory, and with, with your permission, I'd love to try it tonight, just, just for a moment. I'd like to give it a go. Okay, consider, if you would, Macbeth's reaction to the bloody madness and suicide of his beloved wife and the collapse of all his hopes and dreams. What does he say? He's alone on stage and he says, tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow, creeps in this petty pace from day to day till the last syllable of recorded time. Now, that bloke has been in a post office. <laughs> <laughs> Intolerance can grit our souls like a vice at any time. At the front of the communal queue, some bloke has failed to notice for a quarter of a picosecond that a window has come free, and behind him, 15 reasonably decent people, including me, want him dead! <laughs> Why do we waste our precious lives in such pointless anger and aggression? I'm in a traffic jam. I can see it's a half mile to the lights. I know I'm stuck. I cannot move. At least 15 minutes, I'm trapped. But I'm not trapped. My mind mind is free to travel the world at will. So what am I doing with this spare time? Am I thinking beautiful thoughts and remembering some wonderful thing that's happened to me or planning some future pleasure? No. No, what I'm thinking for 15 minutes without a break or a pause is that bloke coming out of the side street thinks he's getting in. <laughs> I'm edging. Edging my car. I'm edging it. It's so close to the one in front, you couldn't get a credit card between the bumpers. <laughs> All up and down the street, the cars are squeezed together. Pedestrians can't cross the road. There's mums with prams. There's skeletons in wheelchairs. They've been waiting so long. But we don't care. All we care is that a complete stranger won't get eight feet ahead of us in a stationary queue. <laughs> That's it, ladies and gentlemen. You've been great. I'd like to thank you. My name is